Good morning, church. It is good to see you today. If we haven't met yet, my name is Jason, and I serve as one of the pastors here, and it's my joy to continue in this series that we started last week called Life in Rhythm. And if you have a copy of God's Word, let me invite you to turn to or turn your device on to Psalm 19, which is where we're going to be today, Psalm chapter 19. Uh, For those of you that are joining us for the first time, I just want to say a special welcome to you. Thanks for being with us. Uh, Today, we have the tremendous honor and privilege of having people join us each and every week. Um, Whether you're an out-of-town guest or maybe you're just new to the church, I hope that you are welcomed well. Uh, Maybe you got one of our gift boxes on your way in. If you didn't get one of those on the way out, it just has some information about the church and some local goodies for you there. It's just our way of saying thanks for being with us today. Um, We are continuing this series that we started last week called Life in Rhythm, and we actually had two really interesting things happen this last week that I wanted to mention to you. I know that this was a whopping six days ago, um, but how many of you were walking around uh, on Monday with these things on? Or you you were at least peering through them, right? Hopefully you were. Um, The solar eclipse that we experienced was so significant that they let the kids out of school so that they could burn their retinas at home and not on the playground, so... Thank you so much, administration, for allowing us to do that together. But um, what was amazing about it and seeing everybody's pictures, I mean, we had a partial eclipse here. There was a total eclipse um, that happened in a large swath of our country, but people are posting pictures of it. And what's amazing about it is we know as followers of Jesus and believers that God's word says that he designed it, that as we're stopping in our day and staring up at the sun and then the moon passing there, that our God created that. And he even created the anomaly that we were able to see on Monday. And we just stopped for a moment, stopped staring at our navels and stopped staring at each other and even in our world. And we look up to the heavens and you're just like, whoa. I mean, it was super, super cool to be able to see those things. Um, I was reminded of uh, David, who we're going to read another one of his songs. uh, But in Psalm 8, Psalm chapter 8, David, he's going, man, you are the God that placed these things. He's remembering sun, moon, and stars. You're the one that created them, and you ordered them, and you sustained them. And he says, when I look up and I see these celestial bodies, I'm, I'm just left with this question, who am I? Who, who am I that the God that created sun, moon, stars, everything that exists, is mindful of me, that he cares for humanity? So as you are looking up, hopefully this week, maybe you got a glimpse of it, uh, maybe it leaves you with maybe just a grander picture of how big God is, but I hope it leaves you also awestruck with the fact that that big God also cares for you. So that was one thing uh, that happened uh, this week. The other thing that happened that was just powerful is last week we talked about the power of God's word. And uh, if you were here in the service, we had uh, random pages from the New Testament that were on the back tables back there, and many people that were a part of the three services, they picked up just one page of Scripture. And uh, the challenge was, hey, take this one page this week and just pour over this page. Take notes on it, read it, meditate on it, just take God's Word in this week because God's Word has the power to transform us in the way that we need to be transformed. And I heard from a number of you that this was the exact page that you needed, and the circumstances were just obvious, that it was not random back on the the tables back there, that God had ordered even the pages that you took. If you're still looking for one page, I think there's a couple more left back there. But what we were talking about in this series kind of kicked us off thinking about the fact that, if you remember, we, we are not who we want to be, every single one of us. There's a gap that exists in every single one of us, between who we are and who we want to be. And that, even, that, that is true even spiritually. And the thing in our lives that has the power to close that gap between who we are and who we want to be is the power of a habit. And so that's why we had the one-page challenge. Start the habit. Start with your day. Start, start giving God 1% of your day. If you remember, 1% of your day is approximately 15 minutes a day. Just 1%. I'm sure you want to give way more than 1% of your day to God, but start with 1%. Approximately 15 minutes a day, just pouring over God's word. Even if it's one page, it has the power to transform you. The reason that it transforms us is because it's from God. It's actually how we hear from God. And the psalmist here, David, in Psalm 19 that we're going to consider today, he actually talks about three ways that God speaks. And we actually saw two of those ways 
this last week. He's going to show us how God speaks to us through his creation. God also speaks to us through his word, and ultimately he speaks to us through his son, the Lord Jesus. And so if you're taking notes, if you've got a note page in the back here, the first thing that I want you to notice as we read through Psalm 19 is, first and foremost, it tells us that God speaks his glory through creation. We saw that this last week in the eclipse. I'm sure we see it all the time. This is the way David describes it. Psalm 19, verse 1 says this. He says, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet, their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. What David is saying here is that when he looks out at the world, what he sees is God speaking, not literally, but loud and clear. God is out there and he is amplifying the message in creation that he is the creator. And this, this word, this voice that goes out through creation, it's really, really loud and yet it's inaudible. It's really, really loud, and it's really powerful, and it reaches every single corner of planet Earth. It always has, and it always will, and it reaches any and every language. It just, it just stretches out to all of humanity for all time, and it speaks of him as the creator. Um, I, I don't know if uh, you're a good communicator or not. Sometimes I'm okay communicating with my words, uh, my wife tells me that one of the ways that I communicate inadvertently and I communicate loud and clear is through my nonverbal cues. Is anybody else like that? Like we, most of us in this room, we can communicate verbally. Some of us can communicate really what we're saying nonverbally, so much so that it's kind of a joke in our house where I'm, I'm sitting with people or I'm doing things and she will like whisper under her breath and has even been known to send me a text and say, watch your face watch your face. And I'm just like, what? And she's like, you know, you, I'm like, I'm fine. And they're like, you, you are communicating something to the people sitting with you. I had a pastor friend. He had an assistant that was in meetings with him and she, she had to watch his face and she would literally text him, watch your face in this meeting. Um, some of us communicate, all of us communicate verbally. Some of us really communicate non-verbally. God communicates in both ways, but his nonverbal cues are really, really loud. And we see them all over the place. We see them in the eclipse, but we see them in our day to day. We see them in the sun, moon, stars, beaches, mountains, the human beings that we interact with. His creation speaks clearly. The, the, the limitation, though, of his creation is clear as well. He, he speaks, but uh, it, it, it's a little bit hazy, and quite honestly, the way that he speaks leaves humanity confused and even distracted chasing after other things. This is the way Paul describes God's creation and how he speaks, but then what we do when we hear that voice. Listen to Romans 1, verse 20. He says, For since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities his eternal power, and his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Notice that there's not a single person on planet Earth in any corner with any language that has any excuse for not acknowledging God. He says, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or, catch this, even give him thanks. And they, and they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. What Paul is saying is that humanity hears God. We hear enough to assume that there is a God, there is a creator, but we quickly run to dishonor this God, and we dishonor him in two ways that he mentions here. The first way that we dishonor God, and it's probably obvious the last time, uh, or the last verse mentioned it, that we dishonor him by worshiping created things. I mean, people 
uh, you know, participate in idol worship all over the world, including in America. And it's not just little statues that we bow down to and we worship. There's, there's big boxes in most of our TVs that light up and illuminate and just they, they, they feed us idolatrous things. And there's so many ways that we don't acknowledge God. We acknowledge the gifts, but we don't acknowledge the gift giver. The other way that we dishonor him he says, is that we don't even think to give thanks. Like, like our heart's tendency is to see these things and either go and worship something that is less than or just dismiss entirely. And that's what we tend to do. So even though God has created this beautiful, brilliant world, and I think we would all agree that the world that God created, it is tremendously beautiful. But it's unclear. The message that creation leaves is unclear. And it's even clouded, honestly. Because when we look at creation, if all we were to understand about God is what we see in the beautiful parts of this world, we also see in the natural world that there's tremendous brokenness, right? That breeze that feels so good coming off the ocean as you're out there walking barefoot, it feels so good until those winds are actually part of a hurricane that's coming to destroy property and take lives. Like, that's what creation does as well. And so God speaks a better word. Even though that voice goes out, the, the, God's nonverbal cue in all the earth, it should clue us into there, that there is a God, but we need to hear more clearly, more directly from him. And so God speaks his glory through creation, but number two, I want you to notice that God then speaks life-giving words through the scriptures. David here is talking about how God has spoken, that he is speaking without sound, his voice is being heard. But then he goes and he starts to tell us about a greater word, greater speech that God has. And he starts to speak about God's word. So God speaks in creation and then listen to how he describes God's word. Verse seven, he says, the instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence or fear for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true and each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. They are a warning to your servant and a great reward for those who obey them. What David reminds us is that though God speaks in creation, he speaks clearly through his word that he has revealed to us. And so why are we challenging you? Why are we stepping into this challenge as a faith family to remember to read God's word? Why would we read the Bible? That's the question that I want to pose. And he gives us six statements that I'm going to summarize in four quick, simple, hopefully memorable statements for you. Notice number one that he says God's word, first of all, one of the reasons we should read it is it's perfect. God's word is perfect. Verse seven, the instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. When he uses the word perfect, what he means is that it's comprehensive or sufficient. Peter would say in one of his letters that we have everything that we need in this life for life and godliness. God has given us everything that we need. And I think the reason that he's able to say that is because we have been left with God's word and we have been left with God's spirit that can help us to understand God's word. Everything that we need for life and godliness is, in, is, is given to us through his word. This word is perfect. It is comprehensive. It is sufficient. I want you to think about this with me because we're going to talk about how it's trustworthy and it's right and a couple other words here in a second. But is, it, is, is God's word really perfect? Like, can we have confidence when we open up, this is a modern English translation, a New Living Standard uh, Bible. When we open this up and we read these verses, can we know that this is in fact God's word and it's trustworthy and it's true and even the word that's used in verse seven, that it's perfect? How can we know that? You ever thought about that? If you haven't thought about it, I know there's people around you that are thinking about it in your life. Well, here's what I want to do. I want to describe how we received God's word, how we're able to open up God's word even today and say, thus saith the Lord. Second Peter chapter 1, 
really critical verse, verses 20 and 21, says this about how we receive scripture. It says, above all, you must realize that no prophecy of scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding. That is, anyone that picked up a pen and wrote God's word that was inspired to do that did it of their own understanding. Or, he says, from any human initiative, somebody with good intentions or bad intentions, this did not come from their mind. No, he says, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit as they spoke from God. What I want to do just very briefly, I want to leave you with maybe an illustration of what it was and how it was that we got God's word. So what scripture tells us, this one in particular and several more, tell us that the, the words that we have over here, first and foremost, they started as a thought from God. You guys see the light bulb? Okay. This is my thought. I'm playing the role of God here just for a second. But the word of God started as a thought from God. God had a thought that he wanted to communicate to humanity. And so he needed a mechanism to get his thought into his people's minds and hearts. And so God took that thought and he passed it off to 40 different authors. Over the course of roughly 1,500 years, three continents, three different languages, people that would pick up the pen would be farmers and fishermen all the way up to doctors. They would pick up the pen And what they were doing is, as they picked up their pen, they had a thought that came from God that became their thought. They knew that it was from God, but it was it was a thought from God, but they they understood that thought. And inspired by God's Spirit with that thought, they took that thought and they put it to paper. So God revealing his thought to humanity, that's what we call revelation. God has revealed things to us which is just such an incredible blessing. He's told us things. And then these things that have been entrusted to these authors, these 40 different authors, they took these thoughts and they put them down on paper, on parchment, and they wrote them down. This is called inspiration. And so they were inspired to write these things and they wrote them down. And and what's amazing about the inspiration of Scripture is you read 40 different authors, vastly different authors, And yet over the course of 1,500 years, different educations and languages and cultures, it all sounds like the same voice. It's not because somebody went in later and edited all of it. No, it was built over time by one singular voice, God's voice, containing God's thoughts. And what they did is they wrote these down, inspiration of Scripture. They had original manuscripts that were sent around to different people, and people saw it, and they recognized that it was God's voice. It was from God's people, his prophets, his apostles. And so they they captured these books together. They all recognized that these were from God, 66 books that God had literally hand-delivered through these authors to them. And then we have thousands upon thousands of copies over the last 3,500 years that have been affirmed again and again and again. And so we have these original uh, language documents that over the course of time have been translated into different languages, including English. Did you know that next year, 2025, we'll celebrate the 500th anniversary of the very first English translation of the entire Bible? William Tyndale did it for us, and he died because of it. They killed him within, you know, a matter of months after translating this into the people's language. But we have it today. And so when we open it up, we believe that God sent these ideas and he's even sustained God's word in in the translations throughout time. So much so that we believe that God has done this, that when we open up God's word, I want you to think about this. It doesn't just stop with this Bible. This Bible is here, and what this Bible contains is that original thought. So when you open this up, here's what happens. You're reading through it. Maybe you're doing it in your one page this last week, and you read through, and you're reading God's Word, and this happens. You're like, oh my goodness. Have you ever had that happen? Well, you're reading God's word and it's like it's, it's, this is like not, not like any other book that you've ever read and it's like leaping off the page and it's like reading your, reading your mail. I'm like, how did it know? And God's thoughts are, are coming to you. This is called illumination. Kind of cool, that's a light bulb, right? Illumination and, and inspiration. And then what ends up happening is you're reading this and it's getting applied to your mind and to your heart. 
do you know that when people like me that are standing up and we're, we're studying God's word, we're teaching God's word, all, all we're doing really is trying to open up scripture and, and throughout the week, you know, we're studying and we're going, oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. And we write that down. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when you stand up here like I am right now, all I'm doing is I'm taking this and I'm trying to go, and here's God's thought. And here's God's, th- these are God's thoughts that have come down to us. This is God's word. So when the psalmist says it's perfect, just know what he, ulti- what he really means is it's perfect. Like it's, it's, it is totally perfect. It is totally true. Not only is it perfect, but the second thing is it's trustworthy, which means it's certain or it's sure. The decrees, verse seven, of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Why is it trustworthy? Because of who it came from. That's why we can trust it. And he has entrusted it to people and he has overseen the entire process. Psalm 119, 160 says this. Of God's word, it says, the sum of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous rules endures forever. If you just want to understand just the whole sum of what is God's word, it's truth. That's what the psalmist says. Not only is it trustworthy, but number three, it's right. The commandments, verse eight, the commandments of the Lord are right. That means that they are, they're, they're accurate. We've already talked about trustworthy and perfect. Perfect. I think what David is saying here when he says the word right, like God's word, it, it's, it's accurate for, for life. Like if you know anything about David, David had really, really high highs and he had really, really low lows. And he's looking and considering God's words that have been passed down to him. And he's looking at him and he's like, you know what? God's batting average is about 100%. Like God says, you should do this and you shouldn't do this. And David, over the course of his life, he says, when God says do this, I've just found out what you should do is do that. And when God says don't do that, I've just found out in my own life, don't do that. God's word is just, it's right. It gets everything right. And then the fourth and final thing is, why do we read the Bible? Number four, it's radiant. This is the term that he uses in verse number eight. He says that it's clear. He'll go on to say that it's pure, it's fair. What he's saying is is that this book is pure, clean, bright, brilliant. He's gonna talk about how it illuminates our eyes. It allows us to see. But the picture that he's painting is that this word, it's it's incredible. That's one of the reasons that, and and words are failing me, but I want you to see, and I don't want you to leave today without understanding that this book, it's, it's incredible. It, it, is, it is holy. It is, it, it is to be revered. I had a pastor, year, when I was a new Christian, um, I was over um, doing a Bible study with him, and I had my Bible there, and I had set a cup or something on my Bible, and he's like, get that cup off that Bible! It's like, what? What are you, I mean, what are you talking about, man? And, and he's just like, you do not disrespect your Bible like that. And to this day, I won't set anything on my Bible. I, I, it might be a little bit silly, but this book is to be revered. You know, there are other uh, religions that revere holy books. Um, I was introduced to a group of people uh, called the Sikh people that are predominantly found in, in India and also in Indonesia um, but uh, or in the Philippines, excuse me. But what they do is, you've probably seen Indian individuals that have uh, like the turbans on, on their heads that have all of their hair. They're not allowed to cut their hair that are wrapped up. Um, the Sikh people worship what they call the book. And they literally worship the book. They believe that the book is life. If you're a good Sikh family, if you walk into their home, you'll notice that there is some kind of stand or pillar as soon as you come into their home where their book, the, their book of life is opened and it's to be worshiped and adored. I was at the temple, uh, one of their more prominent temples in Delhi, India, a couple of years ago. And in this Sikh temple, when you walk in, you see that there's this gigantic throne and display and their book is laid open. And their book actually has attendants that come up to them, and they have these large fans, and there's just servants there that are cooling the book. Night and day, they're cooling the book because the book is alive, 
and they don't want the book to be too hot or too cold. They believe that this book is living. And the thing that breaks your heart is when you, when you see this like grandiose display, you see people that are in front of you and they're just laying prostrate in front of the book and just praying to the book and acknowledging the book and asking the book for wisdom and for, um, and for blessing. I'm going, man, you guys are worshiping a book, which is interesting because the enemy, you know, it's like there's this book that gives life, and they're, they're like this close, you know? It's like wrong book and wrong worship. Good idea-ish, right? What I'm not saying is that this book, like don't go get a pillar and put this at, in a prominent place in your home, all right? But what this book does is it actually, it is perfect, and it is trustworthy, and it is right, and it is radiant, and it's to be revered, not worshiped. But do you revere it? That's the question that David poses to us. Why do we read the Bible? One of the most powerful reasons that he gives us as to why we should read the Bible, one of the greatest proofs is what it does to us. So what is God's word? What, what's the effect of God's word on our lives? Let me give you four things that he says here. Number one, he says that it gives us life. God's word gives us life. Verse seven, the instructions of the Lord are perfect. And he uses the word reviving the soul that we need to be revived. Our souls, David's soul, my soul, your soul on a regular basis, I would say on a daily basis, it needs to be revived. Our heart's natural tendency is not to just be alive and awake to the Lord. It's typically to be asleep and snoozing. That's what it is. Um, I don't know if you've thought about this, and, and some of you would remember these things. We, have these, we used to have these ancient archaic devices that sat on our nightstand called alarm clocks. Does anybody remember an alarm clock? And these alarm clocks had this just horrible feature on them, and the button was actually the largest of them all. It was called the snooze button. Do you remember that? Like, why did you make the snooze button so big? Why couldn't it be like, you know, you needed to get a tool out to po whatever it is. It's just like, so easy, snooze, nine more minutes, nine more minutes, nine more minutes, that's what I did. But our tendency is to snooze like that. I was, I was at a conference one time, and a guy was talking about uh, an alarm clock that uh, he had gotten for his teenage son that would just snooze the day through. And this alarm clock that he got revolutionized his son's life. It was actually this super complicated um, alarm clock. It, it ran on batteries, so you couldn't like just pull it out of the wall. It was like six or eight puzzle pieces that went together and formed this sphere. And what would happen is when that thing went off at 6 a.m. or whenever you were getting up, it came out and said, mur, 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 and it exploded and shot pieces all over the room. And the only way to turn this thing off, besides with a hammer, was you had to go chase around your room and find all the pieces that had been shot all over your room and put this thing back together, <laughs> and it would finally shut up. And, and once it did that, the assumption was, is you've been running around so long, there's no way you're getting back in bed. And some of you are looking on Amazon right now for this exact product, right? <laughs> for your spouse. <laughs> um, but you put that thing back together it, because our natural tendency, if you just leave a snooze bar there, I'm going to hit snooze all day long. The same thing's true, David says, of our souls, that, that our soul's tendency is to snooze, not to be awake and alive. And so how do we wake up? What sends us off in the right way each and every day? It's God's word that brings life. That's what it does. Deuteronomy 32, 47 uh, Moses here, he's giving the law again. He's, he's an old man. He's about to die. The nation of Israel is going into the promised land without him, and he's reminding them of all of God's commands to them. And he says this in verse 47. He says, these instructions, they're not empty words. They are your life. These words are life, and they give you life. They revive your soul second thing that we see is its effect on our life is it makes us wise. It makes us wise. He says, the decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Other translations say making wise the foolish. I don't know about you, but I am a fool in a lot of different areas, and I, I don't want to be a fool. I want to be wise. What he says is, 
If you want to be wise in this world, the only way to not be a fool but to have wisdom is to be in God's word. Proverbs 2.6 tells us, for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. That's what we want and we need. We need knowledge and we need understanding. That wisdom comes from one source and one source alone. It's found in God's word. The third thing he says is that it brings us joy. What's its effect on us? Joy. Verse eight, the commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. Now, some of you, when I, when I read that and you're like, hey, being in God's word, reading God's word, there's just so much joy there. And you're like, uh-uh, I haven't experienced that. Some of you, you have experienced that. You know what it is to have that joy, right? Uh, one of the more profound moments, just understanding God's word and its power for joy is I walked in one time and my wife, um, she was reading through the Psalms, I believe, at that time. And she was reading and she was crying. And I was like, man, is everything okay? What's going on? And she's reading God's words. And she looks up and she's not sad. She is overwhelmed. She's joyful. And she says, he's so good. He's, he's just so good. If, you, if you've experienced that, you, you know that joy, right? You know the joy of going to God's word. And there's just things where you're just like, man, I remember the joy hitting me. I was a new believer. I was in the military. I went into work, and I, I just couldn't help but talk about what I was reading in God's Word. And I was like, hey, hey, guys, uh, did you know, like, in, in the Bible, it's this, this, and this? And, and people were like, you are a weirdo. I didn't know that you weren't supposed to talk about your faith. I'm just kidding. That's a joke, okay? I'd been churched up. I was just, I was reading God's Word, and I was so excited, and I just went in. I talked to anybody that would listen to me about it. I was overjoyed with God's word. The fourth thing that it tells us is that its effect on our life, it helps us to see. It helps us to see. He says in verse number eight, the commands of the Lord are clear and they give us insight for living. Like they, they, they allow us to see when we can't see. Because you and I, as we go through life, we don't see clearly. We think we do, but we don't. But God's word is, is like these lenses that we put on. And so when we put on God's word and we put on God's lenses, we're able to look at the world and see the world clearly. And we're able to see other people clearly. We're able to see ourselves clearly when we look through the lens of scripture. That's the power that it has. And I, I love the way that this section ends when he talks about this, where he says that, you know, God's word, David had come to find that God's word was more valuable than any treasure on planet earth. This was the guy that had the most treasure on planet earth at the time. And he goes, Psh, take, take my banks, take my vaults, <laughs> take all of that. I'll, I'll take this. You can have that. Or he says, uh, it, this word is sweeter than honey. Even, even like, you know, David's thinking of the sweetest thing that he's probably ever had, like honey directly from the honeycomb. You know, that kind of sweet for us, we would say it's sweeter than, than, the, than the hot now Krispy Kreme donut. The, like the sweetest, most delectable thing that I could possibly think of, you know? You ever had a hot now donut? It's just hot and you're going, okay, I can't just eat one. I, I can't just eat one. I need another one. David says, think about the sweetest thing or the most glorious treasure that you can ever possibly have and compare that to God's word and they're incomparable. You see the value and the sustenance that he's talking about that comes from God's word, have you found this book to be that for you? I remember when this book became that for me. I, I, uh, I, I grew up on occasion popping into a church, but largely unchurched. Um, and at 20 years old, I came to know Christ December 7th, 1997. Came into this church, the lowest point of my life, I heard that there was a savior. I realized for the first time that I needed to be save, saved. And I literally had a conversation with God and I said, can we work something out? Let's make a deal. And I feel like God said to me in that moment, sounds good. But I trusted in Jesus. I have words now to say that, but there was a transformation that began that day that carried over even into the next day. So I went through that day 
I woke up on Monday, December the 8th, 1997. I woke up early. Listen, I didn't even hit the snooze button. Like, like literally, I was, I was a lazy glutton. I woke up that, that, that day bright and early, and I drove to this brand new store in town that everybody had been talking about, this bright, shiny store that had anything that you could possibly imagine. It's called Walmart. It was our, the very first one in our area, if you remember when Walmarts were new. And I went into this gigantic store, and I knew that it had everything, and so I assumed that it had what I was looking for. Like Nobody told me to do this, but I drove to Walmart, and I walked back to the book section, and I, I just thought, I've got to get a Bible. And so I'm looking over all of you know, the racks of Bibles that are there, and I saw it. It said, men's Bible. And I was like, yes, if I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to buy a man's Bible, all right? And this is my Bible. December 8th, 1997, in Walmart in Kent, Ohio, I picked up this Bible, the very first Bible that I would ever own. I remember going out to the parking lot and sitting in my car and just opening it up and reading it. And reading it and understanding it. I mean, I, I know that I had picked this book up before, and it just never made sense to me, but I'm reading it. Like, I started in Genesis, and I'm reading it, and I'm like, this is unbelievable. Which, by the way, you want to know how miraculous that is? Friends, this is the King James Version, okay? <laughs> the these and the thous and the thines for a 20-year-old dude, and I'm going, I, it just makes sense. I don't know. It just makes sense. But that day, and to be honest with you, every day since, I, I get what David's talking about. Greater than any treasure that you could possibly fathom. Sweeter than anything that you've ever had. That's what God's word is. And some of you have experienced that. Some of you have forgotten that. Some of you are where I was on December 6th. You've never encountered the God of the Bible. So you've never experienced God's word, and you're going to do that this week. But God's word is a tremendous gift. The last thing that he tells us in this psalm is how God speaks ultimately, that God speaks salvation over us through our Redeemer, that our ultimate hope is in the one that the scriptures point us to, which is our Redeemer. Psalm 19, verse 12 through 14, he says this, how can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults. Keep your servant from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me. Then I will be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. David's saying it, that at the core of one of the things that he's just stuck in and he's struggling with in life is his own wretchedness. And God's word is revealing that. And he's saying, continue to bring it up and free me from it. That's the power of God's word. But then he says this, verse 14, may the words of my mouth, the things that I speak, and the meditations of my heart, these things that are deeply ingrained in me, be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. He's ultimately saying, God, you're my, you're, you are my salvation. You are my redeemer. David didn't have the word Jesus, but we do now that Jesus, you are the one that ultimately is gonna save us. And you save us initially through your son and through your sacrifice, but you continue to save us. You save us continually through your word, again and again and again. Do this, don't do this, go here, here's life, here's death. He continues to redeem us and save us. That's what his word does. And that's what David is describing here. You know, there's a study that was done just a few years ago um, and it was talking about the habits that transform Christians. If you really want to close that gap between who you are and who you want to be, the greatest way to close that gap, there was one habit that transformed people b bigger than anything else, and it was, this, it was the habit of studying God's Word. But here's what's interesting. When they did that study, they found that people that pick up the Bible and they read it one time a week, very little change. People that pick up the Bible and they read it two times a week, very little change. But people that read it three times a week, guess what? Very little change. But listen, 
people that picked up consistently this book and they read it four times a week, it changed everything. They, they, they're, they're, the way that they treated their friends and family and neighbors, the way that they gave, the way that they served, the way that they prayed, the way that they evangelized, everything changed. Why? Because you hit the tipping point of your week, seven days in a week. And when you take the majority of those days and you give them to God, it changes everything. Now, I'm sure if you read five and six and seven, that's fine, but we got to get to four. And that's the challenge for you as we get ready to close here. I'm going to give you a tool. And if you don't have a tool, I hope that this is a helpful tool for you. But I just want to give you a tool. This is one way to read the Bible. How do you read the Bible? We're using the word reap. R-E-A-P. If you reap something out of God's word, you're going to get something out of God's word. So the R stands for read. Obviously, that's what we have to do. We have to pick up God's word and we have to read it. Let me tell you, a terrible way to read God's word is this way. Okay, are you ready? Because a lot of us do this. Reading God's word and go. This is it for today, right? So I'm one for, oh, I don't want to read that. Um, that's not a good way to read. Can God speak through that way? Of course he can. You know, the best way for him to speak is to be continually in it and use a plan. Like have a game plan when you go to God's word. There's lots of ways to read God's word. Um, One of the ways that I personally love to do it is I take God's word one book at a time. Um, There's a couple of publishers that have put out these little handy dandy, they're called scripture journals. You can find these on Amazon, not the alarm clock. But um, these are just one single book. It has the words on one page and it has lines on the other page, and you just, you see God's word, you take this one thing with you, and you highlight, underline, take notes, all these things, and I tend to take in God's word one book at a time. That's one way to do it. If you have the Bible app, there's tons of reading plans that are on there that you can utilize. I know that as a church, uh, Tara Lee Cobble, she has a, a, a podcast and a, and a Bible reading called the Bible Recap. Um, I, had a, I had a guy that's a part of our church come up last week, and he's like, hey, pastor, just just wanted you to know I'm using this Terry Cobble women's study reading plan. I was like, that's awesome. He's like, it's changing everything. It's like, man, praise God, whatever it is. Uh, Pastor Travis, who's, who is away this week, um, he gave me permission to tell you this story, but he uses, on the Bible app, there's a reading plan called the 30-day shred. And the 30-day shred is you read God's word, the whole Bible in 30 days. 66 books, and he does that three or four times a year. Like, he's an animal. Okay, let's just be honest. That's awesome. It doesn't matter what your plan is. You need a plan. E means to examine. Examine means that you're just not reading it to just motor through it. You're actually, you're sitting in it. You're trying, you're wrestling with it. You're highlighting things. You're asking questions. You're, you're taking it in. You're, you're chewing on it. You're meditating on it. Maybe even moving to the point of memorizing some of it. You're examining this word. The A in REAP stands for apply. Remember, this is God's word that contains God's thoughts that he has for you. And when you apply God's word, when he, when he brings his word to you and illuminates it for you, he wants you to apply it to three primary areas of your life. Number one, he wants you to apply it to your thoughts. He wants it to get into your head. He wants you to get thinking in a biblical way. And so he wants his ideas to become ideas that are forming the way that you think. Not only that, but they're ideas that are getting into your heart, right? Right? These things that your heart is meditating on and it's changing who you are. And then the third area is he wants it to get into your hands, right? So that the way that you work and the places that you go and the things that you say are a reflection of his thoughts. The P is for pray. Make sure that our, we're, we're praying as we move through it, that we're depending upon God and we're even speaking back to him the things that we're learning. And then with that, that acronym REAP, I also put the word S on there because somebody that is reaping this really does, they, it, they reap something. And so the S on reaps is to share, understanding that God's word came to you. And it's also headed to someone else because it came to you. Like this thing doesn't stop with us. It starts with us because it's heading somewhere else. Um, I'm getting ready to go travel with my family here right after this service. Actually, I got to go catch a plane. And um, 
if you know, you've been on a plane, I'm sure you've been through that safety, you know, talk. And there's that horrible part, especially when you're traveling with little kids and they're like, in case of cabin air pressure loss, masks will drop from the ceiling, which is terrifying to little children, by the way. But if the masks drop, right, they give you one instruction that you're supposed to follow and you know what it is, right? You're supposed to put your mask on first and then assist those that might need assistance around you. It's the same way with God's word. There are lots and lots of people in our lives that God's placed there that need assistance. But if you're not putting on your mask first, if you're not putting on God's worst mask first, his word first, you're not gonna be able to assist those that desperately need help around you. Let's commit to the rhythm of life that gets us in God's word on a regular basis so that we might be transformed in the way that he wants us to be. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for, even today, the demonstration of the power of your word. Lord, it, it is our firm foundation. Just, just, just a simple word from you, it changes everything. And so God, thank you that you are you're speaking, God. You, you gladly and generously speak to your people. And God, we've, we've been around your words. Maybe even we've, our ears have been tuned and we've caught your word. We've heard your voice today, and I'm so grateful for that. God, I pray that you would continue to speak to your people as they regularly, daily have this Bible intake where they're experiencing life. They're experiencing revival in their own hearts and minds each and every day as they meet with you. And God, we just pray that you'd continue to speak loud and clear to us through your word. That your spirit would illuminate, Lord, everything that you want us to see, you want us to know, and you want us to live out this week. We pray in Jesus' name.